All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to get things started now. So thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How to Achieve Plan Giving Success Online. Uh, my name is Jeff Giannato, and I, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Phyllis Freeman to you guys. Phyllis, uh, if you don't already know her, is the founder of Smart Giving, a fundraising consulting firm based out of Washington, D.C., uh, and they pr specialize in providing plan giving marketing and stewardship counsel for some of the most well-respected brands in the nonprofit sector, including City of Hope, St. Jude's Children Research Hospital, National Audubon Society, Human Rights Campaign, and many, many more. Um, for over the past 24 or 25 years, I should say, of her professional career, Phyllis has held key positions uh, in nonprofit management and fundraising, helping organizations operate and raise money more effectively and more efficiently. Phyllis is on the board of directors of the National Capital Gift Planning Council and serves as and has served as chair of Plan Giving Days in 2013. She's a frequent speaker on the intersection of direct response, plan giving, and stewardship. And uh, she also blogs about plan giving at www.plangivingblogger.net if you do want to you know, find out more information after this. And also, just so everybody knows, uh, we'll be having uh, a little bit of Q&A after the presentation is all said and done. So if you have any questions throughout uh, this webinar, feel free to use the chat tool provided on your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, and we'll field some of those questions afterwards. So. Without any further ado, I will hand the mic over to Phyllis, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to each of you on the phone for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I want to give a special thank you, shout out to Greg Warner and the team at MarketSmart, both for inviting me to present this webinar today, and also for being a terrific partner to me and my clients in achieving plan giving success online. And a lot of the, in fact, all of the case studies I'm going to share with you today are projects that I was able to achieve with clients in collaboration with MarketSmart. So Jeff has outlined for you the um, format we're going to follow, which is I'm going to talk for the majority of the hour and we're going to take questions at the end. But you should use the chat tool. Um, throughout the presentation if you have questions and Jeff will field those questions and feed them to me in case there's something that one of you wants clarification on during the presentation. Um, so I want to just um, talk about what we'll cover. Thank you. As, um, first I want to talk a little bit about why you should be conducting planned giving communications online. And you'll notice here in the sentence that I've written that I'm not just talking here about marketing planned gifts or what I sometimes call lead generation, but it's also entirely appropriate and successful to conduct gift closing or moves management communications and stewardship communications online, plan giving related. And then, as I mentioned, I'm going to use examples and case studies that I hope will illustrate for you how you can make this happen for your organization and how you can do so cost effectively. So the first thing I want to talk about is why you should be doing plan giving communications online. And the first reason is because it's where our donors are. I can't tell you how much it amazes me that even today I still hear a lot of people say, well, our plan giving prospects really aren't online. And I'm here to tell you that that couldn't be further from the truth. So Greg was kind enough to provide to me data across all of their clients and more than half a million respondents to online plan giving communications showing the distribution by age of the responses. And you can see that we have a very good response, more than half, um, actually 60, more than 60 percent, are from people age 65 and older. Now, I want to caveat these percentages by saying that to some extent, the distribution of response is driven by who we select to receive these communications. And I'm going to talk in a few more minutes about who you should be selecting for communication. But what this tells us clearly is that across the age spectrum, um, our donors are online and they're 
responsive online to planned giving messages. To drill down a little bit into this kind of data, I want to show you the um, response for one of my clients for a um, survey campaign that was conducted in print and online. And these are the qualified plan giving responses. We get lots of responses of people who complete the survey, but don't necessarily result in qualified leads. And in a minute, I'm going to explain to you exactly what I mean when I talk about qualified leads. But you can see here that the people who responded positively about their interest in leaving a gift to this organization um, were definitely older people. And again, this is somewhat driven by who gets the emails, but you can see here that our donors are online. And to, whoops, to drill down just a little bit further, in that case study, we got 1,270 responses online and 30 new legacy society commitments. 89 people said they intend to leave a gift to the organization, and a whopping 704 said they would consider leaving a gift. For this organization, um, their average realized bequest is about $84,000. So 30 new intentions is a $2.5 million pipeline that and prospects now that they can steward. So I think you can see that by any measure, um, you can achieve success using online strategies for planned giving um, across the age spectrum and certainly with older donors. The second reason why you should be online is because it's a do-it-yourself environment. Online, a publication can be downloaded, an automatic thank you can be sent, and a next step can be offered, all without the intervention of staff. And I don't really care whether you're a one-person shop or maybe even you don't have a dedicated plan giving person. Maybe you're the person that does a little bit of everything or maybe you're the major gift person that also has plan giving responsibility or if you're at a bigger organization that has gift officers. It really doesn't matter. If you look at the results that I just showed you, um, 704 plus 89 plus 30 leads, that's a lot of leads for staff to follow up. And the nice thing about the online environment is that people are used to getting an auto thank you. They're used to getting um, not necessarily a fast personal response, but a fast response via the medium that they've contacted you through. And all of that can stretch human resources, can give staff more time to follow up. So those leads that I just showed you, the 30 that notified the organization that they've already included them, those people staff can get on the phone with right away. But the next two tiers down, because these people are getting versioned automatic thank yous, staff have a little more breathing room in terms of following up with those leads. And here's an example of the kind of customized automatic communication that the online channel facilitates. So this is a thank you to me. Um, I went online and requested some City of Hope publications. And I, when I was asked the intention question, would I consider leaving a gift, I answered that I intended to do so. So you can see here that the first sentence is customized. It says, we're grateful that you let us know you intend to leave a gift. And this is variable. So if I said I'd already left a gift, it would acknowledge that uh, nuance. And then down below, you can see the publications uh, that I requested. I get an automatic thank you landing page that has the publications for download. But I also get an uh, email in my inbox so that I can go back over and over again if I want to to download those publications. So this is a very compelling reason for doing planned giving communications online. We do, our, our donors do everything in a self-service way online. We make restaurant reservations, we make travel arrangements, we do our banking online, so there's no a difference here in their expectations about how the online channel works. Another reason that it's important to have 
plan giving communications online as part of your mix is that it cost effectively extends your reach. I think everybody on the phone will probably be nodding their head in agreement when I say that we know that about 20 percent of our planned gifts are going to come from people that we never knew about, that never even made a gift to our organization during their lifetime. We get the notice from the executor that we've been named to receive a gift and we look that person up on our database and we can't find them anywhere. And it used to be that that was because of the brand building we did. So we're Salvation Army or we're American Cancer Society, we're a big brand and people know about us and they understand that we do good work and so they leave us a gift even though they may have had no direct connection to our organization. Well, the whole advent of the internet has changed that for every organization. I'm sure most of you on the phone have an e-subscriber list that is orders of magnitude larger than your donor list or your member list or your annual giving uh, audience, whatever you call that group that make the regular annual gifts. So this is an example of the homepage from Ocean Conservancy and on their homepage they have two opportunities for people to give their email address. You can take an action and let your congressman know about your interest in protection, protecting the ocean and all life within it and you can also sign up for e-news. And so we have tens of thousands and in some organizations hundreds of thousands of people who have expressed an interest in their in our work by giving us their email address and that makes it very cost effective to extend our reach for our plan giving message far beyond the people we could ever afford to mail to. So I want to talk about what in my opinion, the winning formula is then, because I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that I recommend that you do exclusively email communications. I still think print is king, and particularly for older supporters, but I do think that there's a smart way to marry the two. And my approach is to view your target audience, your best prospects, and on the next slide I'm going to describe to you who I think some of those people might be. You take your targeted prospects and you marry that group with the mass audience, those e-subscribers, that very large population of people that you don't really know much about them. And if you then combine that with the different channels. So for the target audience, your best prospects, you would invest the most money. That makes sense because they're the people that are most likely to leave you a gift. So they warrant that bigger investment. And so for those people, the best combination is to send them print and email to give them a truly integrated um, strategy. And for the mass audience, which is way too big to be able to afford email, uh, to mail everybody, and because they're undifferentiated, you don't know exactly who they are, use the less expensive channel primarily, which is email. And so if you use this approach, I think you'll achieve the maximum success at generating qualified leads and new intentions, and you'll optimize your budget. So what do I mean when I talk about targeting prospects? Well, m many of you on the phone may know or know of Chuck Longfield. Chuck uh, was the founder of Target Software, which is now a part of Blackbaud, and he was also the founder of Target Analytics. Just a brilliant, uh, one, brilliant guy, brilliant man, and a wonderful human being. And many years ago, Chuck was the first person I knew of who did plan giving modeling. And he called it the passion index. And I think that was the perfect word. I'm sure it was very intentional on his part because I think that's the characteristic you're looking for when you're looking who you should at who you should be targeting. Who are the people who warrant that integrated investment, that print and email investment? And so starting here with the purple box on the top left, it would be consistent giving over years. Now you notice I don't say consecutive giving. 
we think in 12 month increments but donors don't necessarily think that way in fact I have a hard time keeping track of when I last wrote a check to some of my favorite charities so what we're really looking for here is someone who made their first gift 15 years ago 20 years ago 25 years ago has given regularly and is still giving those are some of your best prospects but you should combine that with long loyal donors who are now last. I want to mention Dr. Russell James. I hope every single person listening to me speak has already been introduced to Dr. James and has heard him speak. He is also a wonderful man, but all an incredible, incredible, valuable resource for those of us in planned giving. He is a researcher at Texas Tech University and also is a uh, estate planning attorney by training and has been a fundraiser. So he really understands our work from all angles. And what I love about what Dr. James has brought to the table is that he's not content to sit in his I'm using air quotes now, ivory tower, and publish research. He's very much interested in the practical application of his research by practitioners. And one of the things, and by the way, um, uh, Greg Warner and the team at MarketSmart have had Dr. James speak, uh, do these webinars a few times. And so if you go after this webinar to the resources page on the MarketSmart website, you can find some of Dr. James uh, previous webinars there and if you haven't heard him speak and aren't familiar with his research I strongly encourage you to um, become familiar because he's just an invaluable resource but one of the things he did was um, an analysis of some health statistics research a long longitudinal study and what he found was that uh, estate plans become unstable in the last five years of life and what that means is that donors are in, uh, often take a charity out of their will and likewise put a charity in their will toward the end of their lives and so he says um, some of our best prospects are not our current donors but they used to be he recommend and you know if you're if you've heard Robert Sharp talk you've heard him talk about uh, donors going into that quiet period, the few years before they die when their annual giving may cease. But Dr. James recommends and, and Rush, uh, Robert Sharp also recommends that you stay in touch with those folks and the strategy here would be that you send them perhaps a reduced schedule of communications and focus more on stewardship than on solicitation. So in the blue box would be people with affinity. So that could be alumni if you're an institution of higher education or a secondary school, uh, patient, grateful patients or family members, and people who might have received service from your organization. So quite a few years ago now I worked for Special Olympics and we knew that some of the best donors to Special Olympics were people whose children or grandchildren were Special Olympics athletes or had been Special Olympics athletes so that's an example of affinity presence of donor supplied email I make the distinction here between an email that you can get from a third party and append to your database versus an email that the donor actually provides to you. I'm sure many of you are like me and your inbox is so crowded with messages you're overwhelmed and so you're very judicious about who you give your email address to. So if a donor gives you his or her email address that says something about his, their connection to you. So moving down into the brown box another indicator of passion is evidence of engagement. So people who return a survey, people who come to your events, people who volunteer and especially volunteers who also give. Recruiters are good prospects. That is my term for people who use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising to support you. So in other words, they've gone to your website, they've created a personal fundraising page, and although they may not be writing a check out themselves, they're soliciting family and friends and colleagues to give to you on their behalf. And then multi-channel responders. So we know that somebody who 
gives to you online, gives to you through the mail, comes to special events and pays a ticket fee, those are better prospects than others. So these are all categories of people that when you're thinking about who should get those targeted communications, these are the groups that I would um, look at first. And I want to say something about age because there's so much been written and published and researched and I get this question over and over and over again. What should be the age of the people that I'm uh, marketing to and communicating with? And my approach to this is that if the supporter has these indicators of passion, one or more, and certainly if they have multiple indicators of passion, I would ignore their age for the most part. I not, might not go to somebody who's 15, but I would certainly go to somebody who's 35 or somebody who's 40. Obviously, you have to take your budget into consideration, and you may only have enough to communicate with a certain number of people. So you have to weigh the pros and cons, but if people have this kind of passion, um, I would go ahead and mail to them and email to them, even if they're on the younger side of our spectrum. I say that because even though those plans become unstable toward the end of the life and toward the end of life, there's research both by Dr. James and again by Stelter that shows that younger people are excellent prospects. Dr. James' research shows that a plan made earlier in life is worth four times uh, the amount of a gift made later in life. And the Stelter research shows that as young as age 40, when individuals are making their first will, usually in conjunction with creating guardianship for minor children, they're make, they're, that's the opportunity for you to get into that plan because plans don't often change. So that's what I would say to you about um, the age distribution of the people that you're, tar that you're communicating with. So once you've done your um, marketing, the prospects that you end up with, I refer to as qualified leads. That is what I'm really going for when I work with clients on the communication strategy online and in the mail. And these are the buckets that they fall into. And so when I, in the rest of this presentation, use the term qualified leads, I want you to understand who I'm talking about. So those are people who notify you that they've already left you a gift and are uh, welcomed into your legacy society, the people who say they intend to leave you a gift, the people who say they would consider it, they're not quite as committed as the people that say they're gonna, but they are open to it and thinking about it, and then the people who I call hand raisers who have requested information from you. And those are the folks that when we're measuring the success of our programs, engagement is critically important, but what we're really going after here is qualified leads. So let's talk now about the pillars of a online digital uh, plan giving communication strategy. So the first thing I want to talk about is standalone plan giving emails. This may be self-evident or maybe not, but ideally you will get on the schedule on the email calendar for your institution with plan giving emails as often as you can. And I'm going to talk a little bit in just a second about how challenging that can be. Here's an example of an email sent by City of Hope um, to their entire e-subscriber list. And it's offering a publication that we created specially for uh, their patients, people with a clinical connection or who are dealing with serious illness, whether they're a City of Hope patient or not, because a lot of their e-subscribers are people who are just getting health information uh, from City of Hope. And um, this publication called Taking Control is all about how when you're confronting a serious illness, you, you can focus more on getting better if you've buttoned up your uh, financial and business affairs. And it's a 28-page booklet, and the last three pages are about leaving a legacy. So it's really a publication that we felt would be of tremendous value to their supporters and has proven so in the response to it. 
So you can see that you click on the download button now or any of these links and where you go is to a landing page. Now I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about this landing page because this is one of the most critically important takeaways from this webinar is that the best practice in online marketing is to send people who click through on an email to a conversion oriented landing page not to a page on your plan giving website or your organizational website and that's for a couple of key reasons one is we don't want any distractions and you'll notice here that there is no top or side navigation most of our plan giving websites live within the organizational website and often in addition to the navigation of our plan giving site there's organizational navigation at the top and on the sides maybe even a, an ad for but to become a monthly giver or to make a donation right now. We don't want any of those distractions on the landing page. We want congruence with what they saw in the email. So you see here that the cover of the taking control is front and center. We want a simple call to action. We want to put people in a funnel, essentially, and push them through a sequence of questions that's the only thing that we want them to do on this page. So we give them the opportunity to choose the information they want. In the case of City of Hope, we ask them if they have a clinical connection to the institution. And then question number three, again, taken from Dr. James. You may get sick of hearing me speak about him, but I just can't say enough about the value he brings to our work. I think Greg and I are the unofficial co-presidents of the Russell James fan club, but you'll see Dr. James' influence on virtually everything that we that I do here and that is shown here. So this question number three, which I shorthand as the intention question, is using Dr. James' recommended wording. So here's the results of a series of City of Hope email blasts that we've done during the course of the last year. And I show this to you for an important reason. As much as I wanted to emphasize the characteristics of an, a landing page and why it's important to drive people to a conversion-oriented landing page, I also want to make the point that what we're measuring here is conversions. You see on this chart where we're analyzing our results that we don't have open rates and we don't have click-through rates. I'm not suggesting here that we don't measure those things. We certainly do. We look at that. We look at uh, open rates when we're testing subject lines to see whether one works better than the other to get people into the email. And we look at click-through rates to see whether the image that we're using on the email does a better job of, than the next one at getting people to click through. But what we're really all about here is generating qualified leads. And that is expressed here in terms of conversions. And what you see for taking control, that email I showed you, is that we sent 214,000. We got 11 new Legacy Society members 40 who said they intend to leave a gift, and 47 who are considering leaving a gift. And I want to make a couple of points about these statistics. The first one is, going back to my chart about the, the best formula for success, there's absolutely no way I can think of any organization I know of that could afford to mail 214,000 people a planned giving message. But um, email is so cost-effective that it makes it easy to do and even though these numbers may seem to some of you as not huge I can't think of a single organization I know that wouldn't be happy to have uh, almost a hundred new um, qualified leads in their pipeline for staff follow-up. The other thing I would say about this, and I'm going to repeat this later because I think it's a critically important piece of why um, online plan giving communication is um, so cost-effective, is that we're going to remail taking control a couple of times a year. 
and we've already done that once since the first time we emailed it and those assets exist and we're just going to reuse them and unlike a mailing where you would still have production and printing and postage costs in email it's just getting the new names and hitting send and the assets are already there waiting to be reused especially when you have an offer like that which is evergreen Here's another email. This is for Ocean Conservancy. And the point I want to make here is really about how uh, some ideas for how to work with your digital team on getting on the calendar. Because this is one of the biggest challenges I see um, organizations having is their primary objective for their email is annual gifts, monthly givers, and maybe action alerts and sometimes um, stewardship and it's very challenging to get on the calendar with a planned giving message and so in this case for Ocean Conservancy we do an email once a month except December we went to the digital team and our proposal to them was that we would avoid December which suggested to them that we really understood what they were about because December is the heaviest solicitation month and we said look we're going to steer clear of that we don't we're not going to even ask you for a date in December but we would like a date in every other month and I always say when you're talking with your digital team ask for the moon and maybe you'll get the stars so start with one a month maybe you'll get one every other month or you'll get one a quarter whatever get started then you can show results and that will convince them that you really should get space on the calendar so what we did in July this is the July email we said to the digital team and this is another way that it's important to show them that you want to be a team player we said what is the messaging that you're going to be focusing on in July what's hot in July and of course no surprise they said sharks that's the month of shark week and so we went through and looked at all of our donor profiles and staff who work with donors thought back to visits they made to donors to see if they could think of someone who had a connection to sharks and sure enough we found Peggy and Bill Goldberg who are avid scuba divers and love to dive with sharks and so we told a donor story we teased the copy on the email with a link to finish the story on the landing page and we made the point in the PS that they'd left a bequest for Ocean Conservancy and inviting others to do so too. And so here's the landing page. By the way, the subject line was Love Sharks, These Two Do. And um, you see again, I'm going to hammer on this a few more times just so that the message gets across that um, there's no top or side navigation. All we have here is the payoff, the story, and two opportunities for a next step for conversion to request information and to contact staff and here's the result of this mailing we had 43 people respond we got one new Legacy Society member 14 people said they intend to leave a gift 17 said they would consider doing so and six left the intention question blank and I mention that specifically because to me a blank is a positive answer the intention question on these forms is optional. It's not a required field. Most, the vast, vast, vast majority of people fill it out. Um, some leave it blank and some say no. When someone leaves it blank, I consider them still a prospect because maybe they've just chosen not to disclose. But I think you can see that even though these numbers aren't huge, not as big as the taking control result, and certainly not as big as a survey result, it's a cumulative effect. If you're doing an email every month or 11 months out of the year as Ocean Conservancy does and you get this kind of result each time, you're building quite a pop pipeline of qualified leads for your organization. So we talked now about um, standalone plan giving emails. I want to talk now about incorporating a drive to web or a drive online across your organization not just in your plan giving program so here's an example on the left you see City of Hope's um, 
donor newsletter. It goes as part of their annual giving program. It's actually a print newsletter that mails in an envelope. But every issue, we get a little bit of real estate. And no matter what we use it for, whether it's a donor story or, as you see in these cases in the middle and on the right, um, offering publications online, we're driving people online. Here's another example of, of, on the right is a blog post and on the left is a Facebook post. So we have uh, worked with Mini Matters to develop some uh, donor videos, Legacy Society donor videos, and we posted the video of this donor who happens to also be a volunteer and a former patient um, on the blog and we linked it on the Facebook post and we got just about two, a few more than 200 likes, but he, uh, the donor, got lots of positive feedback um, to, for this Facebook post, and it was great stewardship. In addition to reaching 200 people that we might not have reached, with a very soft sell message about the importance of a legacy gift, and delivered via video, which is such a compelling medium. Here's two examples from an Earth Justice planned giving newsletter. And you'll see here in both cases, we're offering publications and driving people online. I like to refer to it as bonus content. We have the regular content that's in the newsletter and often we send people online to read more or to read something additional. And I want to make another point about these two ads. You may notice that neither of the publications we're offering here, um, nor was that Taking Control publication, specifically about gift types or giving. What we've been finding is that the best result we get is what Dr. James refers to as the spoonful of sugar. Um, he talks about how challenging it can be sometimes to talk about what some people think of as their own mortality in planning, estate planning and charitable planning. And so it's best if you can deliver it with a spoonful of sugar. And so what we've done is we create publications that are of general planning interest. and every single one of them circles back to leaving a legacy. So we always get our offer in there and of course in each publication it has the URL for going online and getting more publications. So I just wanted to point out an example of a planned giving specific newsletter where there's a drive to web component. And then here's the City of Hope um, e newsletter, their institutional e-newsletter, and like that donor newsletter that goes through the annual giving program, we get a little bit of real estate in each monthly issue. And so we did another donor story here about um, a former patient who's gone back to his love of skydiving now that he's healthy and has decided to give back with a gift in his estate. And again, to a unique landing page where the there's congruence between the image that people saw on the newsletter and the image on the landing page, and uh, many opportunities for engagement here to watch the video or to notify City of Hope of a gift. And then here's the Taking Control book. I just wanted to show you that the pages toward the back are about leaving a legacy uh, and how to do it and a drive to download other publications. So now I want to turn to integrated campaigns. That's the, the communication strategy that I think is best suited for your targeted audience, your best prospects. And here's an example of Ocean Conservancy's survey campaign. On the left, you see the uh, print version of the survey. And you can see uh, about in the middle of the um, page in the magenta because that's lasered with the donor's name. You see in the last line you can complete your survey online. And so even in the print version we give people the opportunity to go online. And in the top right corner is the email that went to supporters. And in this case uh, we sent the print to the target audience. All target audience members for whom we had an email address also got an email and we also sent the email to a large number of e-subscribers, not in the target audience. And then in the middle there is the first question of the survey. And again, 
these assets now exist and we're getting ready to redo this both in print and online and it's going to be virtually no cost in the online environment to repeat this because all we need to do is select the audience and update the survey with Dr. James' new research. Um, the response to their survey, here's the mail response versus the online response. I want to caveat these results as I did at the very beginning when I was showing the distribution across age. Part of the reason that you see so much better response from the mail versus online is because the mail went to the target audience. They went to best prospects. They went to older people that have all those passion indicators, whereas the online went to the mass audience that we know very little, maybe nothing about except their email address. And But again, I would say that I think I can't imagine any of you out there wouldn't be thrilled with a modest investment of time and resources to generate more than 100 qualified leads. So I want to now turn away from uh, marketing and lead generation and give you a couple of examples of how you can do stewardship and gift closing or what I call moves management online because the channel works equally well in these instances. So here's an example of a print piece for City of Hope. We have lots and lots of qualified leads. And what we're trying to do is uh, surface the people that really warrant staff follow-up and also get people to raise their hand saying they're open to a visit. We all know how difficult it is to get someone on the phone, much less to get them to agree to um, let us into their home. And so this package was designed to try to get donors to um, open their door to a staff person. And the positioning was not we want to come and tell you all the great things City of Hope is doing. The positioning is we want to come and hear from you why you're so passionate about our work. And we're inviting the donor to lunch. And so they could RSVP in the mail and on the back of the reply on the right here you see we gave a little bit of a story a, a before during and after of a woman who is a breast cancer survivor thanks to her treatment at City of Hope and what we did was we sent an email to everybody who got the mailing and what's unique about this and important about this in many respects is you'll see in the banner it says exclusive invitation for Phyllis. So we customized it to the donor name and this is customized by gift officer. Every qualified lead at City of Hope is assigned to a gift officer and since the gift officers have been reaching out to these people we wanted to make sure that there was consistency in the messaging. So we um, personalize the email by gift officer. And then we sent people online, they could link online and the print piece also had an opportunity to go online and sign up for lunch. Now we only sent 402, that was the number of qualified leads we were working with at the time. And we only got four responses. Now that's a small number in absolute numbers but it was a 10% response rate. And what's phenomenal about it as I've said before is how difficult is it to get people to um, let you into their home? And so there are four people who online raised their hand. Now we have other people who said yes to the mailing. Um, and again, these assets exist now and we're getting ready to reuse them with a new group of qualified leads. And then the last example I'm going to share with you is um, from HRC, Human Rights Campaign. This is another uh, both stewardship and conversion strategy. We sent a letter and an email to their current legacy society, which is called Equality Circle, and to their qualified leads. And we asked, told them that we were going to produce a listing recognizing all Equality Circle members. So for the Equality Circle, we said, we'd like you to confirm how you want to be listed. And for the Qualified leads, we said, if you confirm your gift by a certain date, you'll be able to be in the listing. Now, this is another recommendation from Dr. James, is that if you could give people a deadline and a concrete reason and recognition is important to some people, um, that can help you close gifts. And we gave people the opportunity in the print and the email, of course, to go online 
type in how they wanted their listing to be. We, we told them how we had it in the file, but they could modify it and um, to confirm their gift. And here's what the results were of the qualified leads. We got six confirmed gifts online. And of the Legacy Society, we had 83 people go online and tell us how they wanted to, that they wanted to be listed and how they wanted to be listed. And again, this is in collaboration with the print piece where we got many, many more responses. But you can see that the online channel is a valuable component and uh, creates tremendous synergy with everything you're doing offline. So now I'm happy to take questions. All right. Thank you very much, Phyllis, for uh, giving us that presentation. I know there was a few questions out there uh, while we went through this, just asking about if we were going to provide the, the PowerPoint slides and recording. And as always, uh, the answer is yes. We'll be providing that. Uh, all attendees will be emailed it, uh, ultimately, usually a week or so after the presentation. And then we'll also eventually offer it just free to download on our website as well. So. Now I'm going to field a few questions uh, that we had kind of presented throughout uh, the presentation. Uh, one, uh, we'll start off, has to do with kind of follow-up or maybe too much of it. So the question is, um, you know, I can hardly imagine it, but what should I do if I get too many leads? It seems almost like we could get too many leads uh, from watching, you know, uh, all the things from HRC and, and City of Hope and things like that. That's actually a great question. I'm glad somebody asked it. Um, you can get overwhelmed with leads. You really can. Um, and so you have to be absolutely prepared. You have to have all of your letters, your follow-up versions of follow-up letters created. Uh, a lot of organizations, I mean, one of the things about the digital channel, as I mentioned earlier, is that the leads you get online are going to get the auto thank you, which buys you time. But in the offline world, a lot of organizations uh, get a temp, arrange for a temp to come in to help. They have interns that help. Sometimes they have the um, company that does the um, mail opening for their annual giving program or their membership program open these surveys and go ahead and do the data entry and then send uh, daily or every other day or weekly a file over. So you absolutely do need to be prepared um, for the results because you'll get good results. All right. Our next question uh, has to do with kind of segmentation. So uh, you talked a lot about uh, segmenting off, you know, consideration stage, where they stand in the process. but. Uh, there's also, for a long time, you know, been a lot of talk about uh, age-based segmentation. So what would you say, uh, it, where's the, the time and place for, for if any, for age-based segmentation of your marketing? It's another great question. Well, obviously, there are certain things that are uh, require age-based segmentation. So if you're marketing charitable gift annuities, you're not going to market to younger people. Um, and I know I've heard a lot said about... Um, you know, the messaging that goes to older people about uh, needing to stay in control and things like that. Uh, what, other than the age-based um, targeting that I talked about, I find that donors are self-selecting. If you offer them a, an array of options like different publications, um, they'll self-select what they're interested in. And even people who are older and may already have an estate plan could be interested in something that's pitched as how to create or update. So go back to the basics and make sure you've covered everything. So I don't really do a lot of age-based messaging per se, just more age-based um, selection criteria. All right. Now, uh, one person had asked a question uh, regarding kind of stewarding and, and how to gauge whether you're doing it effectively. So the question itself is, what are the metrics to gauge whether or not you're properly stewarding legacy society members? Uh, you did touch on, you know, reconfirming the gift a little bit, but what are what are some things that we should be monitoring in regards to stewardship? I think the measuring engagement is the number one thing that I would um, say is a way of um, measuring how you're doing at stewarding. Is it a two-way interaction rather than you just sending information out to them? For these survey mailings, I didn't show it to you, but typically we do a version for the Legacy Society and get tremendous response. On a planned giving newsletter, sometimes 
they, they always get a different reply than the people that we're soliciting for a, um, uh, to notify us of a gift and we might ask them additional questions about what it is about our mission that they love and so getting them to engage with you if you have a practice of calling legacy society members I always recommend calling each legacy society member at least once a year to say thank you even if you use outsource callers or um, volunteers and if you see a tick up in the number of donors who take your calls if you see a tick up in the number of donors who take your visits um, those would be indications that I think and a lot of organizations discover second gifts so they may go visit annuitants and learn about uh, a bequest that's been made or they knew about a bequest and the donor then notifies them of an IRA gift so you can also track uh, notifications of second gifts or increased gift sizes all right we've got time for a few more so we just got one a new one that came in um, and it says in a university setting what is the best way to incorporate plan giving messaging and ongoing communications when there are other divisions vying for space, as an annual fund, major gift, etc., our marketing and communications department is often reluctant to give us space uh, we're looking for. So, what are some ways to get, you know, buy-in in a sense? Oh, I feel your pain. That that's a really challenging thing. I tried to give you some ideas about, you know, asking for the moon and hoping for the stars. I do think if you could even get one or two tests, position it as a test, and then if you capture the results as I've shown you here you can say look here's the result and I would translate as I mentioned in the beginning with those um, I forget the number was uh, 30 gifts 30 commitments and their average realized bequest is eighty four thousand dollars you can show that that's worth downstream if these people are properly stewarded a, a lot of money and so I think it helps you make the case if you can do one test um, and the other thing I think uh, could work we've created uh, materials about protecting your digital assets as part of your estate plan which is a kind of a new aspect of estate planning and that's something that the digital team got in terms of oh yeah that's something that maybe our online audience might be interested in because it has to do with online so maybe that would be the first thing you could offer is um, something around that topic okay this next question is more in regards to kind of Facebook Twitter that realm so what do you think about the claim that more people uh, are using Facebook or Twitter than email or maybe some people say vice versa more people are using email than Facebook and Twitter so really I think it's it's you know where is your audience and, and how do you take advantage of that my experience has been that um, our much better results come from email um, we do uh, we're not doing Twitter but we're doing Facebook and we're doing blogs um, and we're doing it because once we create the email it's a very simple thing to grab a little snippet of the message and put it in a Facebook post I guess we are doing Twitter at City of Hope um, so it's not a lot of additional effort um, but we're not seeing a lot of results from it um, so I can just tell you from my own experience that email is, is where it's at this one is in regards to e-newsletters so um, you know there's plenty of people out there I'm sure there's plenty in the audience who send a weekly or monthly or quarterly or semi-annually uh, newsletter and so you know many people some people find success some people don't so what, what is your opinion on a newsletter in terms of you know, what's the frequency that it should go out and also how do you make them as effective as possible I think you have to measure I think for e-newsletters to be successful you need to follow the best practices that I've described here each offer needs to go to a conversion oriented landing page and you need to measure what's working and what's not working in terms of generating qualified leads um, I don't think just traffic on a page is going to give you a as good an indication of whether it's worth doing or whether it's successful or not and with respect to frequency I would just say if you continue to get people uh, converting then keep doing it um, my feeling is you know I get a lot of e-newsletters not 
just plain giving newsletters, but e-newsletters from lots of organizations, and I might only read one every of it for every four that comes. So I think there's a lot of value in the repetition, but I would just make sure that each offer goes to a page where the donor can take a step that's meaningful, that moves them along that continuum of consideration, and that you can track. Alrighty, I think this is going to be our final question of the day. So uh, uh, we had a person say, everything you're saying makes sense. I, I totally wholeheartedly believe in what you're saying, but I work in a small shop and, and we only have a few thousand emails. Um, so do you still think with that you know, quantity of emails that email is as powerful and is, is, is worth pursuing in a sense? I absolutely think it's worth your while. In fact, I think the online channel is perfect for you because you're a small shop. Because of that self-service environment that I mentioned, because these assets are evergreen, and except for the fact that Dr. James is continually providing us with new insights, they only really need to be tweaked and can be reused and reused and reused. Um, so I think um, online is perfect for small shops. I really do. I would just make sure that when you do get these responses, and you will, you triage the new Legacy Society and maybe the Intends group and do some more personal outreach with them. Not every communication is appropriate for online. Some things still need to be done personally. I just want to say before I hand the microphone back to Jeff, thank you to all of you who listened in and I really appreciate your participation and look forward to hearing from any of you who want to follow up. Alrighty, that concludes today's presentation. Uh, just one last message to you guys. We do have a little post survey, uh, post webinar survey and we'd really love for uh, to get your input uh, both in regards to the, the webinar and some other questions we asked. So feel free to fill that out. If you need any further information from Market Smart, feel free to visit our website uh, and you can also find more information from Phyllis at plangivingblogger.net. Uh, thank you again guys.